In the second quarter of 2024, Cyber Citadel's lead security researcher, Rafe Baloch, published his book, Web Hacking Arsenal, a practical guide to modern web pen testing. In this podcast, Cyber Citadel CEO Jonathan Sharrock talks with Rafe about some of the aspects of cybersecurity penetration testing detailed in the book. So let's get into it. Over to Jonathan and Rafe. As long as you can hear me okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, we all know who you are, but you can introduce yourself and let's get going. Well, thank you very much, John. My name is Rafi Baloch, and uh, I'm an ethical hacker or uh, a pen tester or uh, and a security researcher. I'm, I've been uh, notorious for finding zero-day vulnerabilities in uh, Android, iOS platforms, mobile and desktop browsers. I have uh, presented my research at Black Hat, Hack in Paris, and many other similar conferences. I'm also author of uh, two books on the subject of cybersecurity. So we've got Ethical Hacking and Pen Testing Guide, which was published back in 2014, and Web Hacking Arsenal, which was published earlier this year in Q2, known as Web Hacking Arsenal. So, yeah, and uh, of course, you know, I work with Cyber Citadel for I guess, a very long time now, and we we started back in 2017, you know, when we met in Dubai. And yeah, that sounds about right. Um, one of the things I did notice, I mean, it was a bit of a pleasure looking through the book because I could see a lot of engagements that we have done together. Uh, I could see the actual uh, outcome and actually getting it written up like this was very interesting because, you know, I get to read the, the pen testing reports and we get, you know, getting a certain amount, amount of information, but, but seeing it broken down like this and explained uh, like this, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's made it very very a very good read. One section that I wanted to go over because I did notice the fact that I recognised some stuff in the report writing section. I remember that being quite quite difficult getting that right, um, especially when the clients come back to you and ask you for certain explanations on certain findings. I think the way it's laid out, especially with the executive summary and the breakdown, and actually showing evidence, um, not only the fact that something is possible, but showing a proof of concept to actually outline what the actual finding is. But the report writing, do you want to go into a little bit of detail there? Yeah, absolutely. And report writing, I would say it's uh, the holy grail of pen testing. And it is something that, uh, you know, a lot of pen testers and newbies get it wrong. And it und- undermines the entire effort that you've made towards finding all these vulnerabilities because what good are vulnerabilities if the, you are not able to present it to the executives? Because uh, the first and foremost, the most important part of any pen testing report is the executive summary. And the report is addressed to a lot of different audiences. So you've got the executives, you've got the CEO, and um, you know, in, in some cases, COO and CFO, all these uh, you know, C-level officers who are going through the report. And because they are mainly business-related individuals, you know, they come, generally speaking, from a finance background or maybe a risk-related background. So they would understand numbers more and the impact in terms of uh, the, the, the financial impact and, you know, things like reputation and, or maybe impact in terms of the regulatory violations. And that is where the executive summary comes into play and that should essentially cover you know everything that you've done in pen test but of course that technical knowledge should be converted into the business knowledge so for instance if let's say if you have found a sql injection vulnerability which has allowed you to gain access to the backend database and the database is running as uh, sa which is a uh, system administrator or root level privileges so um, and if we write about the fact that hey, we found a SQL injection vulnerability in XYZ parameter and we were able to gain back an access and was running as root, you know, it doesn't mean a lot. But if we talk in terms of the financial impact, if we talk in terms of the fact that we found a critical vulnerability which would allow us to gain access to the backend system which contains personally identified information or you know credit card information or financial information which could lead to financial impact or which could lead to perhaps a, a reputational damage you know if it gets leaked or um, of course if, if it gets leaked and it stands in the violation of let's say HIPAA for instance if it's a healthcare application or 
PCI DSS, you know, in case if it's a financial application. That way you are able to address the executives directly and they are able to get that value. And then, of course, you've got the second sections, you know, things like finding summaries and some of that risk matrix, you know, which is generally speaking addressed to CTO or CISOs. In, in, in a lot of organizations, in small mid organizations, we we would see often see that there are no dedicated CISOs because, of course, they are expensive. And then we've got virtual CISOs. But, you know, you, generally speaking, it is addressed to this, the CTO and CISOs, you know, who have got some degree of technical knowledge. So they would look at your the second section, which is the finding summary, the methodology, the NAST, the OASP or OSSTMM, and all these different methodologies that you've followed throughout your pen test, the scope, the engagement, and the finding summary. But they won't dive into the technical aspects, which is the third part. So you've got the executive summary, and then you've got the section that is addressed to the, the CTO, the risk matrix, and everything else. And then you've got the technical findings itself, you know, which are addressed to the security team and the developers and which should contain most of the technical stuff there. And that is where your technical team, you know, the, the team leads, the pen testing lead, the, you know, the purple team and everybody else comes into play. So ideally, a report should be addressed to different audiences. And I've seen reports from a very reputable uh, pen testing company, which uh, fail to understand this 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 basic distinction you know between all these different audiences what about um i have seen some of the pen test reports you provide a screencast with the actual finding um sometimes it's quite a complex finding uh what's behind that sometimes the findings are a bit complex and it might involve uh, multi-stage exploits it might involve combining several vulnerabilities so, for instance, um, if it's a business logic flow, which involves multiple components of an application, so we are chaining multiple vulnerabilities, you know, we are chaining XSS, we are chaining CSRF, and perhaps we're using that to upload a file. And in that complexity, somehow it's uh, it becomes uh, easier if we record the screen and if, if we show from start to finish at how we were able to reproduce the finding because... Um, a lot of times we have seen that with these complex vulnerabilities, the developers and especially the security teams sometimes find it challenging to be able to reproduce the findings. So um, there are ways to do it. There are steps. Some of the reports might might say steps to reproduce, whereas others, you know, along with the steps to reproduce, we also accompany it with a screencast, you know, which is uh, the, the POC, the action. Yeah, that makes sense. What happens once the pen test report has been delivered to the client. What happens to the report? Well, there is a timeline, and it's a part of um, an internal policy at the Cyber Citadel that we would delete the contents of the report after a month's time, and then we would anonymize the text and the findings, and that goes into our tool, a bank, you know, which hosts, you know, all of the findings that we have found across all these pen tests, you know, that we have done across all these years and it gets feed into it. So any personal data and any client information is is shredded. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And on some banking apps, for example, the, once the client receives the penetration test report, um, we delete the- Correct, the correct. It's, 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 it really depends upon the non-disclosure agreement that we had. I mean, yeah. generally speaking, it comes from the client, but where the NDA is silent, you know, we adopt to our own internal policy which is a month's time. So can you explain, explain a bit about retesting? Uh, when, so when we deliver the report, obviously some retesting, when, when does that happen? Uh, if you've got critical findings, when should it happen? And then what's the whole process that's followed? Well, it really depends upon the organization's internal risk appetite. So some organizations uh, would, generally speaking, fix uh, these critical issues within a day. I mean, we've, we've seen applications, especially, you know, financial applications because uh, in case of financial application it would mean revenue loss and if something is revenue loss it gets flagged up pretty quickly so it moves up in that escalation ladder you know pretty quickly and so it gets fixed within let's say 24 and 48 hours and a new release you know is issued a new build is released however as i said it really depends upon the sort of risk appetite that the organization have so they could have let's say between one to three or maybe up to seven days 
and again it really depends upon the complexity of of the finding as well some findings are very complex to fix as it might require a sort of design revamp and there are certain findings you know in which there are there might be some underlying libraries that might cause the application to crash and not work and so you, there are certain considerations to be made but at the end of the day it really depends upon the organization's risk appetite we have seen um, critical and high risk issues being fixed in the matter of days and we have had clients whereby they have spent months and months and months trying to to figure out more about these findings uh, medium and low risk issues generally speaking they are a kind of a subcategory of uh, defense in depth because um, they, they do not pose a risk to an organization on its own but it could be combined several medium risk vulnerabilities could be combined and it could become more of a high risk or critical vulnerability and and a lot of these medium and, and low risk vulnerabilities could be accepted as well and high risk and critical risk um, by definition it's a, it's a risk that should not be accepted and in that case in an internal meeting what a client would do is um, they would have a debate internally and they would explain why the risk is not that significant and they might downgrade a high risk finding to a medium risk so that could be accepted if that makes sense so as i said like really depends upon that the situation financial sectors organizations in financial sectors you know tend to fix it more quickly healthcare of course but there are certain in logistics sectors for instance you know i've seen the findings you know, critical findings and high risk you know being fixed after weeks and weeks yeah i've noticed the um with the report there's always enough detail in there from our side for you to be able to fix the finding but Sometimes when remedial work's been done, it may still fail. And if that's the case, the client can come back and ask for some more help or some more detail or, you know, are we going about this the right way? But, but sometimes it's a really tricky, tricky one. Like a, you may still be able to bypass it via another method. So that becomes important. I mean, when the fix is implemented as a part of retesting, and this is what not a lot of firms would do, we would generally go about and, and try to verify the fix and also attempt to bypass the fix. So for instance, if it's a fix for SSL cert pinning or a cross-site scripting vulnerability and a fix has been implemented and we see that the fix has been not, not been implemented in the, the correct way or the recommended ways, for instance, our recommendation is to sanitize input parameters, but if uh, for some reason developers had resorted to other methods such as maybe using a web application firewall or blacklisting some of the parameters or blacklisting some input and malicious inputs. And then we would reach out to the client and then we would explain why this is not a good idea. And, and then, of course, we will have a POC of our own. So, and this is something that I've seen not a lot of pen testing companies would go up to that lens and they would say, okay, you know, if the initial finding is fixed, then then that's fine because that's somehow outside the scope. But we are partners, you know, we, we like to treat our clients as, as partners because, you know, I came into security to, to, to add value and to make the world a better place. And so if I see something of, of, of that nature, you know, and, and I know that in the end it would increase my side of the work, but, but at, the, at the end of the day that if, if the client gets breached, then of course it's our reputation on the line. So, so yeah, we are, we, we are very straight about that. So here's a final question. Obviously, looking at page 516, section 14.7, you're talking about a risk assessment. And I remember us talking about it, you know, every finding you do a risk assessment, but also the differences between the uh, CVSS scoring, if you could explain that. I think this is the most important, one of the most important parts of any pen test, because if you misclassify risk, let's say if, if a vulnerability is a medium risk and you as a pen tester classify it as a critical risk or a high risk, what it would mean is that the organization or the client would prioritize this over other work, and which could be, of course, um, some development work that they have to do, or maybe other security work that they are doing. Do, they are doing, and if the risk is misclassified, this would mean that the client is spending more time on on fi on fixing something whereby it should the client should be doing something else. So that's that's of course number one. Even worse is a false positive reported as a critical risk or high risk. And that's that's pretty deadly because now the engineer, engineering is spending a lot of effort. And that's why we've got the, the POC. We use uh, NIST 800-53. We have got our own mat matrix on the basis of that. And we have found this to be a more adequate and more real world interpretation of the risk as opposed to CVSS and CVSS is uh, something that has been criticized by the security community quite a lot. I mean, I've seen 
I mean, of course, you know, companies like HackerOne, BuckCrowd, and all these other companies, they do use it, and a lot of other pen testing companies do use CVSS, but my personal opinion of CVSS is, is that it's not real world. So, for instance, if you've got, hypothetically, a third-party website, and it is vulnerable to maybe an RCE, and let's say if you're able to exploit that RCE pre authenticated and you're able to access that server but that server is not internally connected to the customer's internal network it's not externally connected it's just a subdomain and it does not host any critical data any personal data but if you do a cvss classification it's 10 out of 10 so that's number one and then of course there is criticism about the fact that there was a sort of study whereby we had several researcher examining the same vulnerability using the cvss and all of them come up came up with different scores so there is a lot of uh, discrepancy between between the scores of the same vulnerability, the same POC, and passed on to researchers, you know, who are probably at the same level. So yeah, that is that that is my my point of view on CVSS. Fantastic. Okay, thanks for having a uh, conversation about the book. We'll, we'll 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 break into some more sections and we'll we'll uh, we'll go into more detail. I'd like to do one of these uh, if we've both got time every every few weeks. Definitely love having a conversation about it. I know you and I talk offline a lot about certain things that I, I always think that we should have recorded it for other people. So or we this should is, not have recorded, so of course. Or we shouldn't have recorded it. That's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. As always, a pleasure. And thanks thanks again, and I'll make sure I, I share this about. Cheers. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, bye. You can find Rafi's book via the link in the description below. And subscribe to Cyber Citadel for more up-to-date and relevant cybersecurity information. The risk is real. Defend with Cyber Citadel.